Well, hi everybody. Um, I wanted to step in here and give you guys a quick little video about a result that's really handy for disproving the existence of simple groups. Now, this result is in Hungerford's textbook. It's actually an exercise in the book. It's problem 18 in section 9.5 of Hungerford's book. And it doesn't have a very fancy uh, theorem name associated with it, so I've kind of adopted one that we can use just informally for our own purposes. I'm going to call it the simple group killer. <laughs> it means that we're going to disprove the existence of simple groups of certain sizes. So this is a very handy result for doing that. However, this name that I'm giving it is really just for us to talk about it. You shouldn't be referencing it, uh, for example, in a term paper or outside of this class even. Um, it's not like Lagrange's theorem or something like that that everybody sort of knows what we're talking about. So this is just my name for it, um, but it's a very, very handy uh, result that's in the exercises of Hungerford. What does it say? Well, what it says is that if G is a finite group and we find a subgroup K, so K is a subgroup of G, but it's not the whole group. So notice here I've got this little slash through the uh, line on the bottom of my subgroup notation. So K is what we call a proper subgroup of G, right? So if we have a proper subgroup of G with this little relationship here, the size of the group does not divide the index of the subgroup factorial, that is a factorial right there, uh, then G is not simple, <laughs> okay? So this is the result. If we have a group with a proper subgroup such that the size of the group does not divide this index factorial, then that group cannot be simple, okay? And I'm going to go through the proof of this. It's really quite nice uh, to see how this works. So the proof is going to be um, by way of contradiction. WOC, by way of contradiction, let's assume that G is, in fact, simple. Let's suppose that G is simple. And also, just to make this, this a little bit easier to talk about, uh, I'm just going to call N the index of K in G. Okay, so the N is going to be my notation for the index right here. All right? Notice that since K is a proper subgroup of G, uh, that means that uh, N is greater than 1. Okay, so N is a, a positive integer greater than 1. So let's start with that. Now, as another piece of notation, I'm going to define capital T to be the set of right cosets of K in G. Alright, I'm going to make a collection out of those right cosets. We know that there will be n of them. Let me give them names. Uh, of course, I like to use k itself, uh, which is like the identity coset. And then let's use a few more uh, notations here. kb2, kb3, dot, 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 up to kbn. So we have n right cosets of k and g. So this is a set of size n capital T. Okay, now I'm going to define a function, and uh, let me call this function f, which goes from the group G to what I'm going to write as S sub T. Now that is going to be a notation for the symmetric group, but instead of putting S sub N there, I'm just going to call it S sub T to just emphasize that we're, what we're talking about here is the group of permutations of capital T. So we can permute these cosets, in other words. We have, a, we have a sigma, right, this symmetric group. This is going to be isomorphic to Sn. But what this is, is this is the various sigmas that permute these cosets around that shuffle them around somehow, okay? So our inputs to this function f are going to be the group elements. 
The outputs are going to be some shuffling of these right cosets. And how is this function going to be defined? This is the all-important uh, definition. F of any group element, I'll call it little a right here, is going to be defined to be, well, it has to be a permutation of those cosets. So if I take any coset over there, I'm just going to write it as KB, right? <clears throat> well, this function f of a is now going to permute that right coset to another right coset, and it turns out the one that we want to use is KBA inverse, okay? Now, <clears throat> Remember that all of the right cosets of K and G are listed here. Every single one of them, because there's only N of them. There are N right cosets. They are all listed right here. So when I write down this notation, right, I'm inputting a right coset and permuting it to another right coset. It means I'm shuffling these right cosets around according to this formula. Okay, so again, the input to the function f is just a group element. The output of the function is this whole apparatus, which is itself a function. It's a little weird. The output of your function is itself a function. More precisely, it's a permutation of those right cosets up there. Okay, so it's very important you understand what the inputs and outputs of the function f are. Okay, I would like to note that f is a homomorphism. It respects, it respects the group operation. I would like to try to convince you of that. Let's suppose that we uh, took f of a1, a2, for example. Right? What would that be? Well, that would be the function that takes kb and maps it to KB, whoops, maps it to KB, still can't get it right, times A1, A2 inverse, right? Whatever you plugged in, the inverse of it goes right there, okay? On the other hand, what is F of A times F of B? Or F of A1 times F of A2, I mean. What is this product? Right, I want to see if these are equal. Right, that's the idea. They should be equal. Let's see if we can calculate this as well. Well, this is two permutations composed together. Right, The operation in a group of permutations is composition. So we're actually going to go from right to left as we look at what happens. We start with KB, and going from right to left, we first hit KB with F of A2. So that's going to give me KBA2 inverse, right? Just this one. And then I work to the left because these are permutations. These are basically like cycles, right? It's like the symmetric group. This is a group of permutations. So I'm going to go from right to left. So I'm going to take whatever I plugged in here. So this was F of A2. And now I'm going to apply F of A1 to this. And it's going to give me KBA2 inverse a1 inverse, and hopefully you remember that the inverse of the quantity A1, A2 is exactly A2 inverse, A1 inverse. In other words, both of these two lines are giving me the same ultimate permutation of capital T. And that means that F of A1, A2 is the same as F of A1 times F of A2. Now, this would be a great time to pause this video if you have any doubts about it or you want to uh, stare at anything here. I am going to erase a little bit in a second. Um, again, I'm trying to come up with a contradiction. I'm assuming that my group is simple and I've set up my right cosets of K and, and G and I've made a function that goes from G to S sub T. Let me just erase just this bottom part for right now. I think this is going to give me enough room to, store, to sort of look at what I want to do next. Okay? What I'm going to claim next, now that I have a homomorphism, I am going to claim that f is 1 to 1. I'm going to claim that f is 1 to 1. Alright, so let's see if we can do that. Now, 
<clears throat> if we look at the kernel of f, right, I'm now going to use my assumption that by way of contradiction, g is simple. Okay? So since g is simple, since g is simple, I want you guys to remember that the kernel of f is a normal subgroup of g. Always. Whenever you have the kernel of a homomorphism, it's always a normal subgroup of G, which means that it either, that by simplicity, this kernel either has to be the whole G, or, or the kernel of F has to be the identity element. And of course, this is what we want. If we're claiming that F is one-to-one, -one, we would like to say that the kernel is trivial. Okay? Let's suppose that the kernel is just equal to g alone. Okay? Let's suppose that it's just equal to g alone. I'm going to come over here and try to do a little more writing. This board is not quite big enough for this whole proof. Okay? Let's imagine this happens. Let's suppose that the kernel of f is equal to g. So if the kernel of f was equal to g, now what does that mean? That means that f of everything is the ident uh, gives us the identity element of s sub t. Everything gets mapped to e, basically, right? So if the kernel was equal to g, then f of a, right, which is a function that takes the right coset kb and maps it to kba inverse, right? This would have to be the identity element, right? So this would be the identity element um, right here. This would actually have to be KB, right? And this would be, so in other words, KB mapping to KB, right? What is the identity element in the group of permutations? It's the permutation that fixes every coset, right? So fixing every coset just means KB goes to KB. This would be for all B in the group. And this would also, because the kernel is the whole group, it would be for all A in the group. Right? So that's what we would have. So what do we have? In other words, we have KBA inverse equals KB. Right? This is exactly what this would mean. And what that would tell us is that, well, we, what we can do is we can... Assume, therefore, that, um, that A inverse, let's see, sorry, just want to make sure I say this right. Um, in particular, if we choose, okay, so this is what we need to do, sorry. If we choose B to equal the identity element of the group G, right? then this just tells me that Ka inverse equals capital K. So I can choose B to be anything, right? This is for all B in the group. So just plug in the identity element and you get this, right? But this is just another way of saying that A inverse is an element of K, which is, of course, equivalent to saying that A is an element of K. But that's for all A and G. So that would tell me that K is equal to G. Right? So everything in the group G actually turns out to be an element of the subgroup K. And that is a contradiction to our assumption here that K is a proper subgroup of G. Right? So this is a contradiction. So this is a contradiction. This is quite a little proof, guys. This takes a little bit of work. But the payoff of being able to use this simple group killer in a lot of applications is worth going through the proof. Okay? We're not done yet. We're not done yet. We've shown that the kernel of F is not the whole group G. That means that the kernel is equal to E. So thus, I'll just come here to finish this, the kernel of F is equal to E, so F is one-to-one. -one. We have a one-to-one -one homomorphism. Okay? I'm going to erase this part over here on the right. Okay? So if you need to, pause and rewind if you want to watch any part of that again. Now, we're almost done. We are almost done because now I'm going to use the first isomorphism theorem. Okay. 
So by the first isomorphism theorem, right, if we take G and we mod out by the kernel, the kernel of F is now equal to E, right? If we mod out by the kernel, this will be isomorphic to the image of the function, which is f of capital G. And I don't know exactly what that is, but I do know that that's going to be a subgroup of S sub t. Okay, so this is just G mod the kernel isomorphic to the image of the function. It's the first isomorphism theorem applied to f, right? So now we're just about there, because look, G mod E, that's just G, right? So G is isomorphic to F of G, which is a subgroup of something that's isomorphic, well, it's S sub T, which is isomorphic to S sub N. And the size of a subgroup, by Lagrange's theorem, has to divide the size of the group. So we're using two of the biggest theorems in group theory to do this proof. By Lagrange's theorem now, right, the size of G has to divide the size of the subgroup, which is n factorial, right? Well, n is just this index, right? Factorial. And that's another contradiction. All right. So that's also a contradiction now. So our assumption was that G is simple. We've reached this contradiction. Thus, G is not simple. All right? So that is the simple killer. If we have a proper subgroup of G, such that the size of the group does not divide into the index of the subgroup inside of G, factorial, then G is not simple. Okay. It's a really uh, neat result. Uh, let me give you one quick example of it. Uh, as just how quickly you can use it to show that there are not simple groups of certain sizes. Right? So let me do that and then we'll, we'll call this good. Okay. So uh, as an application, as an example, right, prove that there is, okay, prove that there is no simple group of size 24. Okay, let's see if we can do this. There's no simple group of size 24. So uh, assume that we have a group of size 24. To use my simple group killer, I have to find a proper subgroup. Okay. But we now have a great way of finding proper subgroups. In particular, if I just, if I just uh, factor this number into 2 cubed times 3, right, I can try to uh, count the CELO 2 or 3 subgroups, for instance. So, for instance, um, let's just look at the CELO 2 subgroups for a second. How many of them are there? Well, it has the form 1 plus 2k, it has to divide 3, um, where k is an integer, right? This is the number of CELO2 subgroups. Well, this uh, equation here tells me that n sub 2 is either equal to 1 or 3. It's a divisor of 3. This is by the third CELO theorem. Okay, so by the third CELO theorem, we know this. So this is one or three, but the point is it's at least one. There exists at least one subgroup of size eight. A CELO2 subgroup has size eight. So there exists a subgroup of G, I'll call it P2, with, well, I, I, it has size eight, but in particular it's not the whole group. There is a proper subgroup of my group. My group has 24 elements, my CELO2 subgroup has 8 elements. Right? Let's check this out. Right? So if we take the size of the group, does it divide or does it not divide the index? So the index here would be 24, sorry, I'm just going to put G and P2 here, factorial. Well this is just 24 over 8, which is 3. 
the factorial of that is 6, right? This is not true, right? 24 does not divide 3 factorial. So we have all of our assumptions. We have a group of size 24. We have a proper subgroup of it. The size of G does not divide the uh, index of the subgroup factorial. So G is not simple. Okay? G is not simple. There are a lot of numbers that you can do that with. Right? 24 is just one quick example. You'll be able to get away with using this result for many other things as well. So I wanted to show you the result. Um, the proof of it is interesting. I kind of like showing the proof as well. I hope that it made sense to you. If it didn't, of course, I want you to ask me some questions about it. But in the meantime, we have great applications of this result uh, to showing that there's a lot of sizes of groups that are not simple. Okay, so that means that a group of size 24, if you ever come across one, you'll always be able to break it down, right, in that whole program of decomposing groups into smaller groups. You'll be able to find a normal subgroup, mod out by it, and create, you know, smaller groups, a quotient group and a subgroup that you can then analyze further. I hope this has been helpful. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it, and I look forward to seeing you guys again soon. Thanks a lot for watching.